Good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you to our second September AABIP webinar. On behalf of the moderators, Dr. Siwei Lo, Majid Shafiq, and myself, before formal introductions, we'll go through a few housekeeping matters as we usually do. So first, everyone, please note that this webinar will be recorded. It, along with previous and future webinars, can be viewed on the AABIP website and can be found under the Education tab on the front page as shown here. This webinar will also be available on our YouTube channel, so I wanted to make sure I pointed that out. So next, a couple of important disclaimers. During the webinar, please note that the audience will be muted. So you won't be able to verbally interact with the speakers of the audience, but you can certainly ask questions and communicate with the group during the webinar. All you need to do is type your questions or comments into the chat box, or you can use the Q&A function. And both of these can be accessed by clicking on the icons located in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen as seen here. So also please make sure that your chat is set to direct all panels, panelists and attendees so that we, along with the entire audience, may see your question. We'll then keep track of the questions as they come up and then address them toward the end in a formal Q&A period. But please feel free to type your questions at any point throughout the webinar. So next, we would like to remind y'all that the AABIP does not endorse any specific technologies or products and that the content and views expressed within the webinar represent the opinions of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the AABIP. So we are super excited today to be hosting our very first industry-sponsored webinar. So we'd like to sincerely thank Philips for sponsoring the webinar that we're hosting tonight. So as we all know, the advanced diagnostic procedures that we perform uh, often rely very heavily on the use of fluoroscopy, cone beam CT, various advanced imaging modalities. Radiation safety may not be something that many of us think or talk about on a regular basis, um, but I think we can all agree that we definitely keep it in mind when we're performing these procedures that we're doing. And with the increasing use of these imaging technologies and for various amounts of time during our procedures, you know, with some of the new um, technologies that we're using, I think it's very important for us to start focusing more on this in the future. Um, so we're very appreciative that, that our speakers also acknowledge the importance of this and are helping to provide us with this educational opportunity for um, this webinar tonight. Uh, we have an excellent panel of very knowledgeable individuals who are kind enough to share some of their time with us to discuss radiation safety for the patient and provider, understanding safety and optimizing intraoperative radiography during peripheral bronchoscopy. So this webinar is going to be moderated by us, but also Dr. George Chang, who is the Medical Director of Interventional Pulmonology, Bronchoscopy and Plural Services, and the Associate Program Director of the IP Fellowship at the University of California, San Diego. He's joined by Dr. Michael Secker, who is an Assistant Professor of Radiology at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Also, Dr. Michael Pritchett, the Director of Thoracic Oncology in the Chess Center of the Carolinas at Pinehurst Medical Clinic in North Carolina. And last but not least, Dr. Roberto Casal, a Professor of Medicine, the Director of Advanced Bronchoscopy, and the Director of the Clinical Research Unit at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. So we're very excited to have each of them here tonight to present on this topic and for the expert discussion that will follow the presentations. So with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Stecker to begin. Okay, thank you very much. The slide's coming over good still. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, radiation principles and safety for fluoroscopically guided interventions. Um, the only thing I have to disclose is that some of the uh, charts and things that I'm um, going to be uh, showing are from the guideline that I helped author for the Society of Interventional Radiology. So the question is, why do we worry about medical radiation? Um, and that's because minimally invasive image-guided procedures, generally using fluoroscopy, have uh, largely supplanted many uh, large open surgical procedures um, that are more risky. And as the complexity of these procedures has increased, so has the amount of radiation used to accomplish them. And in 1994, after being informed about some serious uh, injuries from fluoroscopically guided procedures, the FDA published a warning and things have uh, come to a, a, a much uh, higher awareness. 
But we also have to keep in mind that these interventions treat disease. They don't just diagnose uh, um, disease like medical uh, imaging does. Um, also that the radiation risks are generally lower than the other procedural risks that the patients agree to. Uh, these interventions generally have lower morbidity and mortality than open surgical procedures. And in general, patients prefer minimally invasive procedures. And even when the dose starts to get high, the risk to benefit ratio probably still favors completion of a procedure rather than um, an incomplete procedure or completely aborting it. So the medical radiation effects that we talk about can be divided into deterministic effects and stochastic effects. The, the main ones that we really worry about um, during these procedures are the deterministic ones. Um, these are radiation effects that the risk of injury is proportional to the dose received. So the more dose, the more risk. And the main one we worry about is skin injury, but others are hair loss and cataract formation. Uh, the other risk that we talk about is the stochastic effect where the radiation exposure uh, is has an all or nothing response. So either it's going to occur or it's not going to occur. However, the amount of radiation that the patient gets increases the uh, the possibility because they get more radiation. The main example of this is cancer induction from radiation. So the first thing we all have to understand is the fluoroscopic imaging system. Um, all systems have a source, which for modern day uh, systems is going to be below the patient and it emits a cone-shaped beam of radiation upward towards the image receptor, which uh, these days is generally a flat panel detector. They're connected by a C-arm that allows for complex angulations to obtain a better view of the, the anatomy. Um, and the patient lies on a table through which the beam travels and the table can move up and down and back and forth as needed to see various parts of the patient. The highest radiation dose is the peak skin uh, dose, the PSD, which we'll talk about in a minute, but that's going to be located at the beam entry point. Um, and for a supplying patient, that's generally going to be the back. For isocentric fluoroscopic systems, the interventional reference point, or IRP, which we'll talk about uh, in a moment, um, is a defined point 15 centimeters back along the central beam from isocenter. Uh, and another important thing to remember is just like on your camera, these uh, fluoroscopic systems have automatic exposure control. The output of the source is going to vary to maintain a high quality image at the receptor. So if you attenuate the beam more, such as putting a thicker patient in or imaging over denser tissues, the output will increase to maintain uh, the good image and thus the dose will increase. Uh, another thing to uh, mention and to understand the difference of is fluoroscopy versus fluorography. Probably for many of the procedures uh, in, a, in a pulmonary realm, most of that is going to be fluoroscopy, which is the real-time medical imaging produced by the x-ray source on the uh, digital uh, panel in other words, when your foot goes down on the pedal, the machine produces radiation that goes up through the patient and produces an image through electronics that you can watch. And when you take your foot off the ped pedal, the radiation stops and the image holds. Uh, sometimes we like to take a higher quality, really a diagnostic quality image, and that's fluorography. Um, usually the uh, radi radiology technologist will take that picture with a, a handheld button a lot of times people will get out of the room. It's a much higher quality picture, but it requires higher radiation doses. Um, for us, when for us, since I'm an angiographer, when we do an angiogram, we do a angiographic run, which is a series of fluorographic images. Um, and this is just my uh, depiction of a, a typical uh, fluoroscopic procedure uh, where the low dose um, fluoroscopy is down here and the higher dose imaging or fluorography is intermittently interspersed. So we need to go over the definitions of the radiation dose parameters. Um, and the, uh, the really the best um, parameter is the peak skin dose or PSD. And again, as I mentioned, that's at the patient entry site. Um, it's the highest KERMA dose and KERMA is uh, sort of the uh, contraction for kinetic energy released in matter. That's how we measure the energy in these uh, systems. The uh, 
at any portion of a patient's skin during a procedure. So the peak skin dose gets contributions from both the primary x-ray beam as well as from scatters, the only metric that really includes scatter. And as I mentioned, it's the best metric for determining the radi radiation injury risk. However, it's rarely available. It's not on modern machines. If the patient scoots a little bit, it's gonna be, registration is gonna be off. And um, so it's still not really something that's readily available. So as a surrogate for that, we use the reference point air kerma, and this is where that IRP comes into play. Um, a lot of um, older machines or even current machines will refer to this as the cumulative dose is maybe the more vernacular. Um, and this is defined as the air kerma accumulated at a specific point in space. Again, that IRP 15 centimeters back from isocenter. Um, and it does not include scatter, however, it's going to be the best thing to track for skin injury. Uh, the Kerma area product, or again, more commonly known as the dose area product, um, is the integral or summation of that Kerma across the entire X-ray beam emitted from the tube. Um, it's the best surrogate measurement for the entire amount of energy delivered to the patient by the beam. But again, it's going to be across different areas. Uh, and it's the best metric for assessment of stochastic risks. The oldest measure and probably the least useful is the fluoroscopy time. And that's the total time that fluoroscopy is used, the total amount of time the pedal is depressed producing fluoroscopy during the procedure. Um, and it's not particularly useful because you know, 30 minutes of fluoroscopy time over the pelvis is going to give the patient a much higher radiation dose than 30 minutes of fluoroscopy over the forearm for, say, a dialysis procedure. Um, also, it does not take into account those fluorographic image acquisitions, which for, for some procedures can be a greater source of radiation than the actual, just the fluoroscopy. So during these, during these procedures, it's important to uh, monitor the dose metrics. Um, uh, since uh, 2006, all equipment manufactured and sold in the U.S., must provide the air kerma rate at the interventional reference point as well as the reference point air kerma on the screen. And again, as I the I, the reference point air kerma is going to be the best thing to look at. Um, so it should be right in front of your eyes unless you have something that's you know approaching 20 years old, uh, which is probably unlikely these days. Uh, now, because we're focusing on our procedures, it's um, it's acceptable to delegate monitoring to someone else in the room, say your radiology technologist, and they can give you a warning. Uh, and many of the machines are are set that they will beep intermittently um, when certain thresholds have been reached. Again, looking at the reference point air kerma, uh, the recommendation from the SIR is at 3,000 milligray and then every 1,000 gray afterwards. But again, institutionally, you can come up with your own protocols. The radiation dose metric should be archived in the medical record after these procedures, um, particularly those with high doses and to, for patients that have received clinically significant radiation. Again, um, the SIR has uh, suggested that high dose and patient follow-up should occur after 5,000 milligray. Um, some uh, some fluoroscopic equipment will automatically archive the doses um, and the, the, the parameters to PACs, but generally we uh, include these in our reports. Um, and again, when patients have gone beyond the threshold, um, it's good to have them come back and check to make sure that there is no radiation injury. So we uh, follow the principle of Alara as low as reasonably achievable. And that means avoiding exposure to radiation that does not have a direct benefit, particularly to the patient. Uh, there are three ways that we can protect um, against the radiation. That's using time, distance, and shielding. Um, and the, really one of the most important things to remember as far as operator and staff dose is that if you do things that decrease the dose to the patient, it's also gonna decrease the exposure to you. So with re regard to um, time, uh, we can break that down into things that we can alter with fluoroscopy, with fluorography, or both. So with relation to fluoroscopy, if we maximize the use of low-dose fluoroscopy as opposed to standard and high-dose, you'll cut the patient's dose. If you minimize the on-time, um, step on the pedal less, that's fairly obvious. If you do reduce the fluoros fluoroscopic pulse rate. So we usually leave ours set on seven and a half pulses per second, but they can go higher and they can go lower. 
Um, and then if you utilize the last image hold for review so that you don't have to keep stepping on the pedal to say, you know, is that the lesion over there? You can just look at the last image hold um, and that um, is usually just as good. With regard to fluorography, um, the fluoroscopic archiving can take the place of fluorographic imaging when possible. So if I have an intermediate step in a procedure and I want to save some images, I may just save the fluoroscopy instead of using higher uh, radiation dose imaging. Um, if you minimize the number of images obtained in a run and min uh, minimize the frame rate, so we use frame rates anywhere between seven and a half frames per second for a pulmonary angiogram, uh, down to as low as uh, one frame every other second for other things. Um, for both, if you minimize magnification views, you cut down on the on the dose. Uh, that's because ma magnification views use higher dose radiation. And these days you can um, zoom up on the lower dose um, non-magnified images and, and really get just as good uh, um, um, imaging. Um, also using dose spreading techniques where you slightly vary the angle of the image intensifier to spread that dose over a larger area. Um, you do want to be careful about excessive angulation. I'll talk about that in a minute and make sure no other body parts come into the field. So when we look at the distance, we remember that radiation follows the inverse square law. The further you get away, the less radiation you um, are exposed the patient to or less radiation you have. Uh, and that reduces in a um, square function. So if you double the distance, the radiation is one fourth. So in particular, things that move the patient or the object um, and thus the skin entry away from the source and um, are going to decrease the, the risk um, because they spread the dose over a larger area. So if you move the patient up and get rid of this air gap, um, as well as move the patient up and move them away from the source, those both will help reduce the uh dose to the patient. And then minimizing angulation. Angulation in general increases the thickness that the beam needs to go through. And again, when you increase the thickness, the automatic exposure increases the radiation output. Uh, and since most people are relatively oval, um, such as in the example here, you if you minimize this angulation, you will cut down on the dose. Um, and one thing to particularly remember is that if you start getting to extreme angles similar to this, you have to start worrying that unintended body parts will start coming into the field. So when you start out AP, the, uh, the patient's arms are at their side, but when you get to a 60 degree angle, um, the arm will get into the side and that arm will then bear the brunt of absorbing the vast majority of the radiation. And then shielding. Uh, so it's hard to shield the patient too much, but I think of collimation as shielding and that narrows the beam down so that only the part that you're interested in looking at will get the exposure. Um, we, you can also potentially use gonadal shielding probably up in the chest, that's probably less of an issue. And then shielding is sort of more important for the operator and staff, a lead apron and a thyroid shield, lead glasses, um, various uh, shields, and sometimes we even use attenuating drapes. Uh, lead gloves, again, are um, sometimes available, but they're probably not that helpful because things like gonadal shielding and lead gloves, when they get into the field, the AEC is going to kick up the dose and you will actually increase the dose to the patient. Thank you very much. So I'm going to pass off to Dr. Pritchett. Thank you very much. Um, so I've got a lot to cover here in the assigned 12 to 15 minutes, uh, but uh, I'll try to make sense if we rush through. Uh, this is recorded, as Dr. Schwach said, and you can look at it later. Uh, also just gave this, this talk uh, at AABIP in terms of radiation safety and the procedures that we do. A uh, very important part. I built that that presentation really off the back of George Cheng's presentation last year that he did that was fantastic and I've uh, borrowed a couple of his slides as well. Uh, here are my disclosures. Um, so, you know, our current confirmation options are what we used to have. Uh, this is an old slide was, you know, we have regular flora, which is great when you have a giant lesion like that that you can see and you have radial probe, which is great 
if you can see where the lesion is, and if you can trust that what you're seeing is actually uh, the lesion. Is that good enough? Obviously it's not, or we wouldn't be here talking. Um, and so you need only look at this study that shows even with a thin scope and radial probe and standard fluoroscopy, your diagnostic yield, even when you're biopsying masses, three centimeters uh, is really abysmal. So we, we really needed something new. So you might as well toss a coin if you're using just these technologies to see if you're going to get a diagnosis for your patient or not. This is the ultimate confirmation, and this is my pathologist. Uh, and so uh, we know that even when your tool is in the lesion, as Dr. Mehta says, do you know if your lesion is in the tool? Well, that's the only person who can tell you that. And we know that there's a disparity between tool and lesion and actually the diagnostic yield. So what qualifies as advanced imaging? Really anything that isn't simple fluoroscopy. Um, and this was an image taken from our our uh, initial Combium CT scan publication from 2018 in JOBIP. This was an eight millimeter pancreatic cancer met, and this is back before robotics. And you can see the difference between your regular fluoroscopy and augmented fluoroscopy. Uh, and what we need in terms of Combium CT scan to create the augmented lesion is doing a cone beam CT spin. Um, only the fixed cone beam CT uh, systems have augmented fluoroscopy. The mobile systems do not have augmented fluoroscopy. So there's lots of types of advanced imaging, and the field is getting more and more crowded every day, uh, it seems. Uh, it, it really started with, uh, you know, with Combium CT scan, and then we've really kind of branched out into that. So you have some other platforms uh, that are using a form of augmented fluoroscopy, whether it's as accurate as the fixed system uh, where the bed is, is in complete communication with the fixed C-arm on the ceiling. And if there's any movement, it knows that's probably a more accurate augmented fluoroscopy than some of the other C-arm based um, like lung vision, Archimedes and, and Galaxy. Uh, CT fluoroscopy, nobody in our field is really using um, traditional CT fluoroscopy. I doubt that your CT uh, department is going to let you sit there and do bronchoscopies uh, during that. You have mobile CT scans, so everybody's got a Medtronic O-arm laying around in their hospital somewhere that's not being used, so there's a lot of people using that. Um, cone beam CT scan, again, we published that kind of landmark study in 2018 with the Philips Fix system. That's just what I had. We didn't buy it. Um, Siemens has both a fixed and a mobile system, and GE has fixed and a mobile system as well. And then you have tomosynthesis algorithms, and it's important to remember that tomosynthesis is not a CT scan. Um, it is a limited view, uh, depending on the system you're using, either 30 degrees to 30 degrees or 25 degrees to 25 degrees. So you're not getting true orthogonal images in sagittal, axial, and coronal. Um, and so Medtronic's Fluoronav, which is now incorporated in a Lumasite, was the first one to do that. Uh, Body Vision's been working on that for several years and making uh, significant improvements in imaging quality. Uh, and then now the first robot with built-in tomosynthesis, uh, specifically the Galaxy by NOAA Medical, is out. So all of these are different types of advanced imaging uh, that we can use. And again, I'm, I'm thrilled to see so many players in this space now. So let's talk about a few of these. And unfortunately, I don't have time to dig into all the details and data. I know Dr. Casal is probably going to get into some of this as well. So the original is just good old fluoro. Um, and so there's some systems. This is the this is a screenshot of, of mine with the intuitive ion platform. They actually tell you what the optimal fluoro angle is. I think back when we were even just using fluoro, we just stuck it at AP and we never moved that thing at all. And what we're finding is now, you know, we're making it easier for people to get out of that AP and look at multiple views. And if you're a cone beam user, you're very used to doing that, chasing that augmented fluoroscopic image around. Uh, but some of these systems like this are great for telling you, hey, you may get a nice perpendicular view of the tip of that catheter in relation to the chest wall uh, at 39 degrees LAO. So portable C-arms uh, are much different than cone beam CT scan units. Um, and so you have a larger flat panel detector versus just an image intensifier. And there's differences between these systems. And we'll talk about the mobile systems here in a minute. You know, C-arms, slower image acquisition. When you're doing those tomosynthesis spins, uh, you know, it's it's 30 seconds compared to five seconds with a fixed cone beam system. Uh, you can have some higher radiation doses. Uh, again, depends on the quality and a lot of those uh, settings that you have, whether you're collimating and things like that, uh, as Dr. Stecker mentioned before. Um, you know, 
less image quality, but you do have pros that they're portable and that now some of these tomosynthesis algorithms are using just whatever C-arm you have uh, in your suite, which is great because it really opens up advanced imaging to a lot more people. Um, the Combeam CT scan systems, much faster image acquisition. You can get these lower doses, and I'll go into some of the lower dose protocols. You get CT-like image quality, um, and you have fixed systems that are either, either mounted to the ceiling or the floor, flexible platforms. You have mobile platforms now, and that's true 3D uh, interprocedural CT scan because you're getting complete orthogonal planes. This is a CAT scan. And obviously those systems are more expensive, but some of the mobile systems now uh, that are coming out, you know, you're usually, your hospital's upgrading your C-arms every, uh, you know, three, four years. Um, and now these mobile systems are costing maybe sixty, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 more than your next version of your, you know, GE OEC or whatever you were using. Mobile combi or mobile CT units, uh, again, we're not expecting anyone to go out and buy these to use these with bronchoscopy, but we're having people use them because they have availability and access to them. The neurosurgeons have essentially given up on the Medtronic O-arm, so we've started to incorporate that uh, with our uh, intraprocedural CT scan. This is Dr. Tim LeClaire from Intermountain in Utah um, doing ion robotic bronchoscopy with a Medtronic C-arm, uh, and there's been publications on, on that, including its radiation dose. It is a bit higher radiation dose and some of the Combium systems, particularly those that have uh, dose reduction protocols built into them. Here's just an example of that uh, going after this lesion. And you can see that he's a little off target. And you can actually see that when he gets the needle in there, that he gets a little bit of bleeding uh, there. So that's what high resolution imaging can do for you during these procedures, more so than, than what tomosynthesis can. And here's another tool in lesion image uh, from an intraprocedural uh, CT scan. So cone beam systems, these are the fixed systems that are the most common. There are some other one-off brands, um, but it, usually in your hybrid ORs uh, or in your angio suites, this is what you're going to find. The vast majority of the data that's been published is with Philips and with Siemens. The GE, uh, no offense, it's a nightmare to work with from a bronchoscopy standpoint because of where it sits at the head of the table um, and the way that it spins. The nice thing about the augmented fluoroscopy is you can use it with anything. It doesn't have to just be with robotic. Uh, all but one of these images are mine. Um, the top left one is Amir Abramovich in Israel. He's a, a big ultra thin guru, but all the rest of these are ways that I've used augmented fluoroscopy during my procedures, whether it's with the Monarch robot or ENB. I like it for EUSB because I have no vision when I'm sticking that EBOSCOPE down into the esophagus. I don't have vision. Yes, if I'm patient enough, um, but I'm already there. I do a quick spin and I can see exactly uh, where that lesion is when I have to go through the esophagus. Uh, it's great for linear EBIS when you are when you have a lesion that you can shove that uh, scope down there, especially with the new smaller EBIS scope. Uh, and then obviously with just a steerable catheter with an ion robot. This is what a, a Combium CT scan spin looks like during a procedure. This is our older system that took eight seconds. We now have the newer Azurian system that takes five seconds. Um, and, um, and this is what it looks like with uh, a Siemens Artisigo or Dyna CT scan. Again, a lot more things to figure out in terms of placement uh, with this system when it does that spin. Uh, where's your robot going to go? Where, you know, and you see the, the tech in there is standing behind a shield. And that's one of the things that Dr. Stecker mentioned. So the radiation dose really for cone beam CT scan to staff should be zero. You should not be in the room. I stay in the room at the head of the bed along with my anesthesiologist and we stand behind a lead shield. Everybody else is outside the room. Um, we published an abstract looking at both of these together with robotic and comb beam uh, and had a high diagnostic yield, even for very small lesions. You can see the yield for 10 millimeters or less was 90% with an incredibly low pneumothorax rate. Um, and then the fantastic group um, at UT Southwest, including Dr. Schwalk here, published this study in a full manuscript, really just kind of showing the same results, high diagnostic yield, high negative predictive value, very low pneumothorax rate when you combine these. And now what we're really encouraging everyone to do is in every study that they publish, 
publish your radiation dose. You should be publishing the dose from fluoroscopy, the dose from fluorography, which is your cone beam CT scan spins, um, and then your total DAP uh, or dose area product for the procedure. Here's just an example of using augmented fluoroscopy in combination with that. So here you see I'm right on the lesion in AP. The lesion is barely wider than my 3.5 millimeter catheter. And I'll look at a different angle, that 70 degrees LAO. Um, as the previous speaker mentioned, you have to be cautious and limit when you're using these extreme angles because not only are you using more radiation, but it's also more scatter uh, and radiation to anyone in the room, even during regular fluoro when you're going at these angles. So we try to minimize these, but here you can see it's vitally important because now I can see that I'm just posterior. I need to move anterior and only anterior. So here I can use my endoluminal compass. I know that I'll move that direction. I make an adjustment. And now my tool is right in the middle of this lesion that's barely wider than my catheter. The very important thing also with cone beam is that you can confirm it in multiple planes. One plane, uh, or as radiologists like to say, one view is no view. You really have to have three different views. And so that enables you to do more challenging lesions like this with on the axial, it looks like it's in the mediastinum. Um, and so I wouldn't do this case without comb beam. Uh, and so here you can line it up in AP, you can line it up in lateral, you put your needle out and there's your needle right in the lesion. Uh, to make all my fellow bronchoscopists feel better, uh, my pathologist said, this is blood. And I did another needle pass, it's blood. I did forceps biopsy and on the very first forceps biopsy said, non-small cell carcinoma. So I share your frustration about being in the lesion and still not getting a diagnosis. We now have mobile cone beam CT scan units. And so you have the newest kit on the block, which is the GOEC Elite 3D and the Siemens CO Spin. Now these are fantastic, but they are not meant or they weren't designed to be used in the lung. So whereas the Philips system now has lung suite software that we've developed over lots of years of working with them, and now there's a button on there that says lung and automatically defaults to lung windows and things like that. These are really meant for some vascular work, some ortho spine work. So even the windows, you know, when you do your scan with these is kind of a, a, a more grayish, not a perfect lung window, but they're great and they work well and they're mobile. You don't get as high a resolution as you do with the fixed systems, but you can still get pretty amazing views Here's some of the early studies uh, that have been put out looking at this. And now there's you know, a lot more. Here you can see, again, a little bit more of a grainy appearance. The windowing isn't perfect lung windows. But again, you can see, even in a 3D view, your tool in the lesion in true orthogonal planes, axial, sagittal, and coronal. Um, and now you have some of these platforms integrated into different uh, things. So again, with the tomosynthesis platform, that's built into the NOAA robot. Cone beam CT scan is now incorporated or fully integrated, not just compatible, but fully integrated with the intuitive robot. So this is a screenshot from the intuitive robot. And it says, hey, we're ready to look at your cone beam CT scan. So this is what that looks like. Notice that there shouldn't be anybody in there. There's somebody with a pad, but they got out of the way pretty quick. And the staff is outside the room. Now, this is a longer scan. This is a 30-second scan for a lower, or if you have an obese patient, you might actually have to do a 60-second scan. So these are long breath holds, which are totally fine. Um, and But it's really nice to be able to get these images, very sharp, clear images, right at your fingertips. You can adjust the window there on the robot not on the cone beam CT. And you can see your tool, you can see the lesion, um, and then the system recognizes that, updates the position, so you go from virtual to a real position. Uh, tomosynthesis base, again, don't have time to go into all of them. Medtronic's Fluoronav was the first uh, to hit the market, um, and they've done a great job with that. And the Illumicite platform, this is Body Vision. And again, I mentioned the NOAA Galaxy platform that has their own um, tomosynthesis built into their robot. But this is what you're looking at with tomosynthesis. Um, and these are somewhat blurry images. You have to be perfectly in plane to get them to be sharp. But here you can see, so it goes blurry and then in focus, blurry in focus. So it's not perfect. But what you can see from this image is that my brush is inferior to my lesion. Now let's compare that with cone beam CT scan. Exact same lesion, exact same position crisp, clear, you can see the vasculature, it's so much better, right? But do you need that? Well, again, that's up to you as far as whether you need it or not, or what you have access to. But again, being able to use a C-arm, 
to get some great quality images to help you adjust and help get a diagnosis for your patient is what this is all about. And then I'll close with the radiation considerations. You heard a lot of this mentioned in the previous talk, so I'll skip over some of this, but we're really talking about what the effective dose is, um, and that's the absorbed dose. And then it depends on, as he mentioned before, the organ sensitivity, 30 seconds in the pelvis is different than 30 seconds on the arm and things like that. And so we have, um, we measure this in, in uh, milligray uh, per centimeter squared for a DAP or dose area product. And then the millisieverts is the international unit that we like to try to use. And here's just some context so that you can see what other studies are. When you order a CT angiogram, and we all know your patient comes into the ER for a stubbed toe and they get a CT angiogram, of course, that's 15 millisieverts and nobody bats an eyelash about it. Heart cats, EP studies, 15 to 39 per hour, uh, and nobody bats an eyelash about it. So um, not to be cavalier about it, but the doses that we're working with are far less. Here's some uh, of the literature with uh, exposure to the patient, um, both with CBCT guided bronchoscopy. This is not robotic. And this is before the dose reduction protocols. And then you can see on the right two columns, this is compared to when you're doing a CT guided biopsy or a cone beam CT guided biopsy. And so you can see that for the most part, our doses are even less than a CT guided needle biopsy depending on what system you're using. This is a fantastic study by uh, the group in the Netherlands with Eric van der Heiden, uh, but really showing that with these dose reduction protocols, we can dramatically reduce the procedural radiation. They went from an effective dose of 14.3 millisieverts down to 5.8 millisieverts. And their fluoroscopic exposure, they decreased by 88%. So a really dramatic drop. And you may think, well, did they suffer in terms of their yield or their resolution? They did not. The diagnostic accuracy uh, went from 72% to 90% while still decreasing that. And then you can look at a study like this that really shows you what is the dose um, to the staff. And, and what you see there is that the dose to the staff is incredibly low. And so as long as you're taking the proper precautions with distance and collimating and using lead shields and lead glasses, I can't urge that enough. I see so many uh, pictures and videos on LinkedIn of people doing cone beam CT and fluoroscopy and uh, without lead glasses, and that's very important. Um, but again, if you look at what the standards are in terms of occupational limits, um, and we compare that to the previous study, you can do 125,000 bronx with fluoro per year. Um, and if it goes up to 10 microsieverts, then you can do 5,000 bronx a year and still not exceed uh, that limit. Philips specifically has input some dose reduction protocols. And to my knowledge, they're the only ones that, that have uh, really been that successful at achieving this. And we have these dose reductions both on cone beam CT, which you can see on the left, we have a normal, a medium, and a low dose. And we also have dose differences on fluoroscopy. Both of those are very important. Here's what that looks like. On the right is a low dose, and that's about 0.5 millisieverts per spin. And it's very difficult to tell the difference um, when you're looking at that compared to a normal dose, which may be two millisieverts. So our procedures are now very low dose in terms of effective across the spectrum uh, of where we're doing our scans. This is without collimation. If you collimate, and you can also not just collimate your fluoro, you collimate your cone beam scans to just the area that you need, and you can really dramatically drop these numbers. So we've been able to do 56% radiation dose savings per procedure, uh, and this has been verified internationally uh, with Kelvin Lau in London, Eric van der Heiden in the Netherlands, and myself uh, in Pinehurst. So should we be worried about radiation dose? Not really, but still, we want to make sure we keep the annual radiation dose low. Know your equipment, know your settings, know how to change it and collimate it. Uh, all the personal protection, all those things, and the Alara principle that um, was previously mentioned as well. Uh, and in this, I, I like this quote from, from Dr. Mehta's article in 2018 in terms of where we needed to go. He said, going forward, the continued unmet needs include continuous guidance, real-time confirmation and visualization of the lesion location, advanced tools and imaging to locate and access challenging lesions, and seamless integration of concurrent imaging such as cone beam CT scan, and, and we have arrived at that destination. So I'm going to stop there and I'll hand it over to Dr. Casal.
Thank you so much, Michael. Let me share my screen. All right, I hope everybody can see my screen now. So yes. thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael, and thank you uh, again to the AVIP webinar uh, series committee for the invitation. And I'm glad that uh, though I'm part of this uh, radiation uh, safety lecture, uh, my talk is not going to be about radiation because I'm not nearly as well versed as Dr. Pritchett or um, Dr. Stecker, of course. So, in fact, I think tonight when I go back home, I should check and see because I may glow in the dark at this point at this moment. So, anyway, but I think that my talk is going to follow really well uh, Michael's talk, and, and he already showed these advanced imaging that uh, modalities that can allow you to correct for the CT to body divergence, and I was asked to talk about potential strategies to avoid. This, this phenomenon. So these are my uh, disclosures. And this is the outline of the talk. Uh, again, uh, uh, I'll talk about city body divergence and I'll kind of divide my talk in what I call the static and dynamic city to body divergence. So of course, you know, over the several decades, you know, since the 1970s uh, till now, you have seen, you know, this evolution of bronchoscopy and uh, sort of you know, an increasing diagnostic yield and sensitivity for malignancy until the early 2000s, where it looked like we were stuck, right? And in, in the diagnostic yield, no matter what we did, you know, we could not go over that 50 to 70% yield. And I think that the gap that we crossed, you know, was the addition of these advanced images that allow us to realize that when we thought we were we had arrived at the destination, we really hadn't, right? So we thought that we were on target many, many times with uh, falsely positive radio probe Im images and uh, and virtual targets that were not matching the actual targets and and this is where the concept of city to body divergence um, actually came up you know point by uh, Dr. Pritchett and other pioneers uh, in in this field which essentially is the difference in the lung anatomy the volume and the shape of the lung particularly the shape you know between the preprocedural CAT scans the patient uh, undergo to plantar navigations and the shape and the volume uh, on the anatomy of the lungs when patients are under general anesthesia, right? So there's going to be a mismatch between the virtual bronchoscopy tree that was created with these lungs at TLC and the bronchoscopy tree uh, under general anesthesia, which uh, renders a mismatch between with the virtual target and the actual target. And that's what's been called CD2 body divergence. And I'll start by what I call static, uh, by divergence. And I mean static, when I mean static, I mean the divergence that originates, that is uh, secondary to the difference in lung volumes between the full inspiration, CAT scan that is done uh, for navigation, and the breathing at tidal volume that we see during our uh, bronchoscopy. We call it static, if that's during breath, breath hold, and then during another breath hold, if we do the convincity, you know, a tidal volume, that's the difference that we're gonna see, which can be twice as much, you know, lung uh, volumes, uh, I mean, uh, twice as much volume in the, in the lungs, right? So, but this is something that, you know, we're unlikely to be able to avoid, we're unlikely to be able, I mean, we cannot uh, ventilate patients, you know, uh, uh, with this high tidal volume. So otherwise, everything's, everything's gonna move and it's gonna be very difficult uh, to work. But there are other factors that, of course, that can affect, you know, our lung volume and the shape. And some are obvious, but not so common. Of course, through effusions and ascites, you're going to avoid, you know, uh, doing bronchoscopy on patient, you know, with these issues. And and, and you're not gonna if somebody uh, the CAT scan, you know, with it for planning, you know, has by lot of effusions or large effusion, and then that has been drained. You obviously it's pretty obvious that the shape, you know, of the lung is gonna change. So you always wanna have, you know, the CAT scan that we use for planning, kind of close as close to the procedure as possible, particularly if they have these issues. But they're, they're rare and, and we know that we have to correct them. But then we have the not so obvious uh, and, and not so obvious because you cannot see this with the uh, fluoroscopy, but then we know now uh, that they do occur and this is the intraoperative uh, atelectasis. So atelectasis you know, has been an issue during general anesthesia uh, for many years. We've known that for uh, from the surgical data for about 50 years, but we just started recognizing that and the deleterious effect in bronchoscopy in the last five, six years, when we started using this additional or advanced imaging like Convin CT that showed that you know our patients were getting atelectasis. And, and why do they occur? Well, the, the, there's one formula that everybody has to keep in mind, which is a transpulmonary uh, gradient, which is the alveolar pressure minus the pleural pressure, right? So anything that decreases the alveolar pressure 
uh, such as having a bronchoscope you know, in the airway or blood or coloring in the airway, or anything that increases the pleural pressure, such as having the diaphragm come up you know, when the patient is paralyzed, right, and, and increase the pleural pressure, is going to decrease the gradient and result in, at in atelectasis. So we know that very often, uh, uh, since we don't have so much time, we know that this happens quite often. And uh, not surprisingly, in this study, we showed that, you know, of course, the higher your BMI and the, the higher the time under general anesthesia, the higher the rate of atelectasis that patients are going to have. And these are most commonly located in the lower lobes and mostly in the posterior segments. Most of, more than 50% of these segments are going to be atelectatic at about 30 minutes of general anesthesia. And there are several strategies that have been proposed, you know, to uh, to uh, to overcome this. And I'll just show this table for the sake of time. So we have the VESPA trial, which was a multi-center randomized trial of patients undergoing EVAS, and we looked at this at electasis with a CAT scan and what we call time two, which was up to forty to fifty minutes after general anesthesia. We used we did not use increased tidal volume, but yes, we used eight to ten of PEEP, and uh, and we resulted well, there was still atelectasis in any atelectasis in almost 30% of the patients. And then you have these other two strategies that uh, pioneers in our field, such as uh, Dr. Badra and Pritchett have uh, also published their experience uh, with LNVP, Land Navigation Ventilation Protocol, and the second most recent trial in which they added this uh, description of a breath hole. Again, you know, uh, the primary outcome was the rate of atelectasis, and they use twice, almost twice as much of tidal volume and, and PEEP, but it more or less, as you can see, resulted in the same rate of atelectasis, there's no comparative head, head trial, and there probably would never be one because it's so similar that it would take thousands of patients to prove it, that there's a that there's a difference. But uh, but this, this, these are the strategies that have been described so far, and uh, I don't want to sound uh, biased because I drive this bad boy, you know, to work back and forth uh, every day. No, actually, I don't want to sound some bias because uh, I. <laughs> I carried out the VESPA trial, but if uh, if you have two strategies, you know, one, you know, uses half the pressure, half the total volume, results in the same rate of atelectasis, and, and I'm sorry, and I didn't, forgot to mention here that it's much uh, safer, you know, with a lot less hemodynamic instability. This is probably the one that I would, you know, personally recommend, and just assessing objectively the data and not because this was our uh, study. But there are other things about these uh, strategies that I'm going to mention in the next few slides. And again, you know, despite all these strategies, no matter how PIP this is, I want to highlight that no matter how high your PIP is, you know, it looks like, you know, a quarter to a third of the patient, they will still get atelectasis. Who gets the atelectasis? At least in our trial, when I look, it's those with very high BMI. And maybe Michael, you know, can comment on that as well. Anybody with BMI less than 30, more than 35, you know, it's very, very hard, you know, to prevent this, no matter you know, with tidal volumes or, or, or pressures you use. And that's why, you know, very recently, we also started working on positional strategies to prevent atelectasis, such as the lateral decubitus. This is not something that is a practical, you know, for all, you know, uh, platforms or robots or, or navigational platforms, you know, it works really well, you know, with the uh, with, with the ion. And, you know, we just, we publish every short research letter in which we prove that none of our patients, you know, at least 10, 11 patients will get atelectasis. But what's more important, we've done in over 100 patients here uh, already with zero atelectasis, and we're actually properly studying this in a randomized trial against uh, VESPA for patients, you know, with small lesions located posteriorly uh, in the uh, in in the lungs. And our primary outcome is that the rate of atelectasis obscuring lesions, which is really uh, what what we really care about. And one thing that came out of these trials, and we've seen it a few times, you know, is that it, it's a crossover trial, right? So we had several patients, very few patients, uh, when we come with Vespa, uh, they got atelectasis. And when we cross over to lateral acubitus, not only, uh, I mean, not only lateral acubitus is good to prevent atelectasis, but it, it's also pretty good to get rid of them. Like there's a the case, this was not part of the trial, but a case just like this one, you know, that we get uh, atelectasis, we don't know exactly, we assume they're in the lesion, but we cannot see it. We put them on the side, recruit them, and the atelectasis goes away uh, immediately. Now, having said so, you know, we, we uh, this preventing atelectasis, we prevent the atelectasis, uh, uh, completely eradicate or, or even minimize the CT2 by the advantage well, it's not going to be eradicated. And, and I don't know if it's going to minimize it or not. And I can show you several trials that in which, like, like this one uh, again from Dr. Pritchett, in which he used high tidal volumes and he used a peep, uh, of 8 to, uh, 8 to 15, 
And you can still see, you know, and this was done with uh, EMN and then confirmed with convinced T, you can still see that uh, what they call before the location correction, before, you know, using the data on the convinced T, you know, 30%, you know, there was a zero overlap of the actual target and virtual target, and another 30 something percent, there was less than 25%. So again, strategy, a strategy to uh, prevent a telegraphy was applied, there was still quite a bit of uh, city to body uh, di divergence. Studies also with, uh, not this is not only uh, relevant for EMN, this is now, for example, a study on shape sensing uh, technology, I mean, uh, robotic bronchoscopy, right? So a different kind of electronic navigation. And also in this trial, they also use a high peep, 12 to 15 centimeters, and they still found uh, this divergence. We ourselves, you know, we haven't uh, published this yet, but in this trial, you know, we actually did the robotic bronchoscopy with ion, navigate to the lesion, look at the virtual target, put the needle into the put the needle into the target, and then do the combin CT. Well, so the needle was in the target only in 35% of the cases in that first city. Of course, we were, we had a couple of more spins, we were able to achieve two in lesion, but in, in but in all these patients, we were using a strategy to prevent atelectasis, either Vespa or LATS, you know, according to that was the operator's choice. But it's still showing you uh, that preventing atelectasis uh, does not eradicate combi, uh, I mean, CT2 by divergence, and we don't even know to what extent it minimizes it. And we were kind of close in this trial, and uh, I don't know the explanation for that, but we weren't that far. We're closer than what's been uh, described uh, before. And I think, in my uh, opinion, that it may be that we, our lower tidal volumes it may have had something to do with it because they cause a lot less motion. But so do we need to prevent atelectasis at all? Well, I think we do, but I'm not so sure that we need to prevent them, you know, to uh, because they're going to minimize the, uh, the city to body divergence. I think that the most important uh, point is that, you know, to prevent atelectasis from obscuring target. We don't want to see something like what you see here, this bottom panel, this huge, you know, lower atelectasis and in our, in, our, in, our, in our nodule disappearing inside of it. I think that's the main reason why I, I personally uh, use these strategies, not so much uh, to correct for CT2 by diversions, the static CT2 by diversions, that we can actually always correct for it, right? We cannot prevent it, but we can always correct for it with all the imaging modalities that Mike uh, just explained in the prior uh, lecture. And so very briefly, what, what I call, what do I mean by dynamic CT2 by divergence? Well, that's that's the one that is caused by the respiratory motion, which is actually directly proportional to your tidal volume. So of course, you know, this is a, a very a simple drawing. You know, our, our kids know, you know, how your diaphragm goes down, you know, so the chest expands, you know, anteriorly, laterally, and, and all these, uh, the tidal volume, you know, the, the tidal one that we use, you know, and, and, the, and every every single breath is gonna move the target uh, all around. And by how much, that's been studied in the past, and, and, and but this study was done with CT scans performed prior to electromagnetic navigation and then, uh, during the case. So actually it's not tidal breathing, it's you know in between the full inspiration and the end of uh, an expiration at tidal uh, breathing. So they very elegantly uh, calculated a vector, a uh, respiratory movement vector, uh, combining the movements in all uh, directions. And this is what they have. This is the average, you know, movement, you know, for for the upper lobes and about a centimeter and two to two and a half centimeters in the lower lobes, all the way up to like five, six centimeters in the lower lobes, the closer the lesions uh, to the diaphragm, the more the movement. And again, so we you, we may think that uh, if you have, you know, that the, that your that, that the catheter or the robot or whatever tool you use to get to the, to the lesion, you may think that it moves, you know, with your target, and in part it does, but it's also very rigid, and and it doesn't move as much if you're unless you're immediately uh, in contact with the target. You know, your target may move more than that that your uh, that the robotic catheter or uh, edge catheter, whatever it is that you use, uh, because of the rigidity of your tool, right? So it's still, you know, the movement may not be as much in between, you know, your target and your tool, but there is, you know, considerable uh, movement. And I think that. Actually, this city, what I call the dynamics, it's to white divergence or the respiratory motion, uh, it's much more of a problem uh, than a static one. So, do all uh, lung nodules move? No, I think that they're, I mean, I mean, of course, they all move in, even in the upper lobes, but the areas, you know, where we really care about, you know, that they're really high risk of movement or where the movement 
is much more pronounced and it can make it very difficult if there are small lesions are the areas that are closer to the diaphragm in this basal segments of the lower lobes, but also in the middle lobe and uh, the lingula. So we have to keep that uh, in mind in those cases. So I believe, and this is just uh, my opinion, and and that you know, and 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 this is what we see. You know, we use, fluoro use fluoroscopy, ventilate somebody with 400 mLs, and then ventilate that same with a lesion that you can see, and then ventilate the same patient with 800 mLs, and uh, and look at the diaphragm and the lesion if you can see it. So I, I believe that you know, high tidal volumes, you know, can cause a lot of motion, and it can be counterproductive. We maybe may think and we thought also in the past as well that a higher tidal volume was similar to the full inspiration of the pre uh, procedure coming CT, but I think it, it adds a lot of movement and unless you do some breath holds and I'll go in, into that in the next slide, you know, it may make it harder uh, for you, you know, to hit a lesion. And 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 I just wanted to highlight so in this uh, third you know panel here the latest um a report on on this LMVP in which they had the breath holds you know, they, have, they did very, very long breath holes in order to uh, sample the lesions. And, and you may have to do that, you know, these high tidal volumes that we're using, you know, we're exaggerating that uh, movement. And I think that the breath holes and Dr. Badra and, and anybody who's using them, they're on the right track. You know, I, and I, I believe that the breath holes, you know, will be needed, particularly, you know, for smaller lesions uh, that are located in the high risk areas uh, for respiratory motion, these breath holes may be needed. I, Personally, I think that the short breath holds up to like a minute, which is something that people can physiologically do, may be enough, you know, for, for some of us, you know, to just take a needle and, and sample uh, the lesion, but maybe longer breath holds will be of help as well. And I think that, you know, we should study them. Uh, and I mean, they have not, you know, there's no data on longer breath holds. There's very, very little data that comes mostly from studies on uh, apnea tests or brain death, uh, or also studies, uh, physiological studies, um, for divers, which were, you know, very, you know, uh, athletes or at, le at very least, you know, healthy volunteers. So we don't have data on our, popula on our population, but I think that, you know, Dr. Badra is on the right path. And the main reason why is that I think that this, what I call the dynamic CT to divergence is more of a pain than the static one. So in summary, in summary, and I'm sorry we're over the hour. So I don't think that we can avoid it and there's no, uh, and th there's no data so far to prove that anything that we use minimizes the CT2 by the versions, no comparative data. We just, you know, think we're doing the right thing, but we're not sure. And, but uh, luckily now we have the imaging technology that can help us, you know, correct uh, for that. And again, atelectasis, I think that we need to correct it, you know, to prevent any atelectasis from obscuring lesions. I'm not so sure that it has much of an effect uh, or at least we know that it will not eradicate your CT2 body divergence. If I had to prevent atelectasis, again, for now, with the data that we have so far, you know, we recommend uh, Vespa and if your uh, platforms allow, you know, and once we get this data, you know, out, you know, maybe lateral decubitus will also be another uh, promising technique, in particular when we get the randomized uh, trial uh, re reported. I don't think that high tidal volumes have proven uh, to be beneficial based on the data that I have analyzed uh, in the literature and, and it obviously aggravates the respiratory motion. So um, unless you're gonna combine that with a very good <laughs> breath hole, it probably should not be used routinely. Short breath, hole, breath holes you know, are safe and, and may be useful in small targets located across the diaphragm and longer breath holes may also be proved to be useful, but uh, we just need to study them. You know, they, I don't think we should take this lightly for to six meter bread holes, I mean, they, they should be studied, you know, before we generalize it. So with that, I conclude my talk and thank you everybody so much. Fantastic. Six minutes of breath hold. That give me palpitations. <laughs> so um, uh, anyways, uh, uh, thank you guys. Thank you, uh, Dr. Excel, Dr. Pritchett, and Dr. Uh, 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 Sticker. Um, I really uh, appreciate this opportunity from the panelists uh, uh, to be sharing this forum with you um, and uh, and the phenomenal talk all around. And thank you to the uh, ABIP webinar, uh, webinar and our moderators, uh, Dr. Shafiq, Logue, and Shalk, um, for this opportunity. So um, uh, without further ado, we're going to get into the questions. So really, uh, as we uh, delve into this era of advanced imaging, um, we need to create some type of standardization of how are we reporting the radiation dose uh, that is being exposed. So, so to the panelists, 
Um, what, what are your thoughts about what is the universal way or what's the best way that we should be reporting uh, in our bronchoscopy studies um, uh, regarding radiation exposure, both to the patient and potentially to the staff that is uh, in the room? Um, uh, and, and is there something that is accepted, uh, uh, accepted unit that we should be reporting? Uh, I open this to, uh, to everyone on the panel. Well, I, I mentioned a little bit about this before, and we've put this in some of our papers. Um, you know, the the dose air product or DAP uh, should be listed. I also think that you should list in millisieverts uh, because it's an international um, guide. You also have to make sure you're using the proper conversion factors. Um, so, for example, for Combi CT scan for the chest, it's 0 0.16. You know, so there are there are uh, adjustments that you need to make, but you need to list it as for the whole procedure, for the fluoroscopy part, for the exposure or fluorography part. Um, and you need to do, you need to list the number of spins that you're using and what is the average dose per spin as well, in addition to the total. Um, that, that would be my recommendation. Egan, I can, I can speak to what we do in, in radiology. Uh, usually, uh, we report all three. Um, again, the Kerma um, area product is is what a lot of people report. It's, again, more for the stochastic or the cancer uh, risks, but it, it also relates more to the cone beam CT because the dose is distributed around that whole area of the body. Um, the, uh, the reference point air Kerma really would be if you're primarily working in one main projection and using a lot of fluoro in that projection. And then that might help um, determine the, the the skin risk if if there is um, a large number there. And then uh, we still report the fluoroscopy time, because even as I mentioned that it's a, a poor indicator of the, the risk, it does help you um, potentially stratify procedures because a high fluoro time is an indicator for a, a complex procedure. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at these um, presentations, it seems like we're talking a lot about uh, biopsying lesions. And perhaps, if, you know, if you look at the ones that had high fluoroscopy time, may um, may not really have that much higher radiation um, in the in the other metrics, um, despite them being um, more complex. And that might be something that would be helpful to to know. Um, again, working up in the chest, there's a lot of air, and so your radiation numbers are probably going to be lower than what um, others might have if they were working down in the pelvis where there's a lot of bone or up in the head uh, where there's a lot of bone to attenuate the beam. I actually agree with you guys, and but one may have, maybe I have a question for you. So, I mean, you might uh, know, uh, mention about using the conversion factors, right? But uh, we really don't know which uh, are the most suitable conversion factors, you know, for each one of these uh, technology. And it's different from system to system. This is my understanding. I spoke with some imaging people and physicists, and, and it differs from uh, for each model, for each part of the body. So I think that the those are your product you were mentioning. And, and if you're going to use conversion factors, uh, and maybe they should, you know, uh, they should actually... Uh, report the entire re range, right? So from the lowest conversion factor to the highest one, like when we report diagnostic yield, right? So with this definition to this other definition, okay. maybe some, something like that. Uh, but include yeah, those agree. Are products so that we can then compare, you know, study to study, right? Yeah, so that's the reason for mentioning it in so many different aspects. And yeah, the conversion factor is different per fixed system, per company. Philips has one, we use 0 0.16 with the Philips system. Um, you know, But in your reporting, you should also list exactly what the conversion factor is that you use for your study so that other people can make comparisons. Those are very good point. And I think that, uh, you know, to, to be, um, uh, to be completely frank, I, I, I can, I find it really hard to even just delve into the system themselves and look for milligrays, you know, <laughs> so it's, let alone to calculate conversion factors. So, so it, it, it would be a very educational for the field to actually have some type of guidance on how to calculate this and how to be aware of each each system have different penetration, different dosing, each organ system have different conversion factors that's associated with it, uh, and that we should be uniform in terms of how we're reporting this and, and take a take a page from our 
the interventional radiology and radiology colleagues uh, about how they're reporting uh, so that we can best compare system to system. Um, and, and speaking of system to system, this is, a, again, a, a question that is going to be synthesized both from previous from, from a question we received prior to the webinar and also during the webinar um, so talk, we mentioned um, multiple different systems available, mobile combing system, fixed combing system, OR, OR systems, tomothensis systems. Can you comment a little bit about the differences between the effective dose between these systems? Um, perhaps namely between fixed versus mobile systems? Or, um, or, or any sense, any sense of which one of these systems have more uh, radiation dose exposure to our patients and to our staff. Yeah, with the mobile systems, you have different grids. So you have a, a low, a normal, and a high usually. Um, and, and those numbers have been published by the manufacturer, but I think we really need studies and, and and people actually using it and patients because it changes with the BMI and things like that. So you may get something like, oh, well, this is 0 0.3 millisieverts with a mobile system on the low, but if you're never using it in low, then it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, you know, Janet Reisenauer from Mayo published a study using that. Her dose was 8.1 millisieverts per patient in the study. She did an average of two and a half spins. So we're in the same ballpark in general. Um, uh, again, I think that the the one that stands out more, and this is not because it's sponsored, but you know the dose reduction protocols that we've seen with the Philips fixed systems, and again, they don't have a mobile system, so we can't talk about that. Um, the the fixed systems, I think, by far they stand out uh, amongst the fixed systems. Um, I haven't seen any data on the GE OEC. I know. Um, uh, you know, the group at Vanderbilt is working with that and trying to push out some data. Uh, Roberto, you've been using the Siemens for a while. Can you comment on the radiation doses you've seen? Yeah, I'm not muted. Yeah, so like you were saying, you know, I think that the radiation doses that we've seen, and again, you know, I, I don't have the data summarized, but I, I would report it in my MCAP uh, trial. It's uh, slightly over what's been published before with the fixed combin uh, CTs, but most of the radiation comes from the fluoroscopy and yeah. uh, and not, not from the spins themselves. It's just the fluoroscopy time. When you look at it, you know, most of, most of the cases, you know, have a similar number of spins, and some have twice as much radiation. And you look, you look at the fluoroscopy time, that, that's where it was coming from, not, not for the spin itself. But yeah, so what I've seen so far in um, in the data that, that, that we have here, the radiation was slightly larger than what's been reported in particularly the protocols in which they use those reduction with a fixed community. So, so does cropping a fluoro image uh, impact uh, exposure? So I, I think what they mean more is the collimation. I, I think of cropping as sort of post-processing where you can cut out um, cut out part of the image to, to you know, it, make your image look um, more like what you want to see. Um, but in the actual acquisition, if you collimate down to, um, you know, you got a quarter of the size, um, you're going to have a quarter of the exposure. Okay. So, yeah, so I agree with that. And George, you had a great slide. Sorry, I didn't have time for all of them. You had a great slide showing the collimation that you do um, and really just dropping that in. So you know, you're bringing in these shutters and you can do it from the side. Most people know you can do it from top to bottom, but you can do it from the side as well and really drop that dose. Um, you know, whether that dose that we're using for these procedures without collimation is ever going to harm the patient. Who knows? Probably not for our kind of procedures, um, but it's good to get in the habit of minimizing that both to the staff as, as well as yourself. And you mentioned before about reporting the doses to staff. Really, it, it takes a little bit of extra work to do that because you really need to have two dosimeters to do that, one outside by your collar and one on the inside. And that would be great if people were going to do that and, and report that, uh, but probably doesn't need to be in every single study. And as, as far as the collimation, um, the collimation will also cut down on the scatter. And so thus it'll improve the image that you get. Um, so it's yeah. sort of a bonus. Yeah, I com completely agree, actually. I and mean, sometimes we don't see some of the nodules uh, as you are uh, when you don't collimate. But when you collimate and you actually take away the darkest shades and just have the 
most brightest area, they actually accentuate the nodule very well because of the auto uh, leveling um, uh, that we do. Um, so so I uh, completely agree with that. Um, okay, so one final question on, uh, from the from the audience and for myself, uh, you know, most of the study, uh, so sorry, uh, most of the ventilation strategy that we uh, uh, discussed during the talk focuses on to how to reduce CT to body divergence. Uh, and uh, with CT to body divergence, there's obviously the static and the dynamic component um, related to atelectasis versus actual uh, tidal breathing. Um, do you foresee a time where the ventilation strategy can potentially reduce the number of spins that we need uh, to actually capture the necessary information of tooing lesion? Uh, and, uh, and also um, uh, along the same lines, do you actually see breath hold potentially cause more atelectasis or less atelectasis uh, in, your, in your view? Yeah, so... I'm not so sure about you know the, the, the I mean uh, unless you know you you know you don't use the strategy and you get a telectasis then you need to get rid of them and that's gonna take you more scans but I, I'm not so sure that it's gonna reduce the number of scans uh, that you will need you know uh, and again you know, unless unless you allow you know for uh, for a telectasis to uh, to happen to begin with now the, with regards to the breath holes I think it's uh, the papers from Krish and and, and 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 Michael are really good in explaining how to do the breath holes and how to use the APL uh, valve you know and and keep make sure that you know you keep that APL valve you know the pressure level at the level of the peep that were, you were using in your strategy and I think that alone you know will prevent that breath hole from causing atelectasis right so I think they have very nice graphics if you look at the two papers or, or, or a couple of papers from them uh, explaining that. So I don't think the breath hole will cause uh, atelectasis. And these the strategies, will they make you, I mean, uh, get what you need with less radiation? I I, 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 don't, I don't think so, you know. I, I, again, you know, if you're, uh, unless atelectasis occur, and then you need to do something else with your strategy or change it or go to a lateral decubitus, you know, but, but if not, I don't think uh, they will have that effect. Yeah, I, I would agree with those points. And, and I've really changed the way that I do things since I first published what we used to call the Pinehurst Protocol. I've really changed. I agree with Roberto that the, the tidal volume is a lot less important to me. For me, it's all about using a big tube, getting the tube in quick. Um, I don't actually use recruitment breaths uh, unless there's a delayed intubation, but I'm also standing there in 100% of the intubation. So I know if it's prolonged or not. Um, and so it's really more about the PEEP uh, for me and, and less about the tidal volumes. Um, I don't use the APL valve anymore. I just do a vital capacity maneuver under procedures. It's a lot more steady, uh, but you have to watch the waveform and make sure it goes up. So I, that's going to continue to change and evolve. I don't think it's necessarily going to cut down on the number of scans that you do. You know, I, I used to do a scan at the very beginning of every single case back when I was doing it with just ENB or the edge catheter. And since I switched to the robot, I don't do the spin at the beginning. I probably do comb beam in maybe 20, 30% of my cases now. Um, so I only do it when I feel like I need to. And sometimes it's when my pathologist tells me, hey, this looks benign. And I say, well, I want to make sure that I'm in the middle of the lesion. But that varies. You know, I have very fast onsite path. If you have slow onsite path or no onsite path, then you may want to do what Chris does and verify you're dead in the middle of that lesion before you start doing your biopsy. So all politics is local and you may do it a different way where you're at. I'm a lot less uh, self-confident and I check for doing the lesion before I biopsy anyway. Yeah. I, my, my exception, and so I don't do it with biopsies, my exception to the not doing a spin at the beginning is for ground glass lesions. I'll always do a spin at the very beginning for those pure ground glass lesions, but otherwise I, I don't do that. And that saves time and radiation. Fantastic. Thank you so much uh, to uh, all our speakers. And I'll hand this over to uh, uh, the webinar organizers. That's yes, thank you all very much. Um, that was an excellent webinar. We we know each of y'all are busy, so we acknowledge and appreciate the time it took for y'all to put together these presentations and speak with us. Uh, you know, well over over the hour that we asked you for, so we really appreciate that. We certainly want to say thank you again to Phillips, our sponsor for the webinar tonight. Um, this topic, you know, as as we've said, is something many of us may not have as much knowledge about compared to. Some of the other procedural aspects of our jobs, but it's certainly very important for us um, to continue talking more about in the future. So thank you all again.
So remember that the recording for this webinar will be available both on the AABIP website soon and will also be available on the AABIP YouTube channel. So make sure you let others know that they can also check it out if they were unable to attend tonight, or you can certainly um, check it out again at your leisure. We also want to thank everyone who took the time to join our webinar tonight. We hope you can join our future webinars and other endeavors from the AABIP. We'd also like to remind you, if you're not already a member of the AABIP, then please consider joining so you can take advantage of everything that we have to offer. And lastly, we hope you can join us for our upcoming webinars. Uh, we'll be hosting our next webinar on Tuesday, October 3rd at our usual time. We have a great panel of speakers that will be discussing how to prepare and submit high quality session proposals for the next annual conference. So we sincerely hope you can join us, um, particularly if you're planning to submit a proposal and have it accepted for the 2024 conference. Um, the, they'll likely be due sometime in October, early November. We don't have this specific deadline yet, but keep that in mind. Um, so thank you all again, everyone, and we'll see you in a few weeks for our next webinar. Well, thank you. Thank you.